Hello and welcome to Dateline, where each week some of the UK's best-known columnists debate the week's big stories with journalists whose Dateline is London, as they report those events to the world beyond. Today, Britain's royal wedding with an added dash of American soap opera. Israel celebrates its 70th birthday and a special present from Donald Trump, whilst its troops clash with Palestinian protesters to deadly effect. And like father, like son, as Kim Jong-un delves into an old North Korean playbook. With me to discuss those stories, Stephanie Bell an American who writes for Bloomberg, Nabila Ramdani, a French Algerian writer on Arab affairs, Polly Toynbee, whose columns appear in The Guardian here in the UK, and Thomas Keelinger, known to readers of Germany's Develt, he's also a royal biographer. Now let's begin with the marriage of Prince Harry to Meghan Markle, who made her name on the US TV legal drama Suits. Miss Markle is bringing more than just Hollywood glamour to the firm, the nickname said to be used by members of the royal family itself. A carefully choreographed series of announcements by the palace this week was derailed by the will he won't he walk her down the aisle saga revolving around her largely reclusive father Thomas, once a lighting director on that old warhorse of soap opera land, General Hospital. I mean, Polly, in the end, that was resolved with uh, Charles Prince of Wales uh, doing the honours. Um, how much hope do you rest on the ability of Meghan Markle and all she represents to, to introduce some element of change to Britain's monarchy, to the House of Windsor. It never changes. It always says, amazing modern young people, You're amazing they have a baby, amazing they get married. All they ever have to do is exist and reproduce. They don't have any other duty or function. They make us an absurdity on the world stage, this Ruritanian fantasy. I mean, there we are, a country tearing ourselves apart over Europe. And suddenly, this wedding cake mythology, this lunacy, it symbolises in this country uh, everything that's worst about a huge amount of power and money and inheritance and the worship of that. But I'm afraid it's very popular with 80% of our people, so we have to go along with it until people come to their senses and say, what do we mean? this very ordinary family being sanctified as if there was something special about them. They're quite dim. They have no known intellectual interests. That's a they're sweeping generalisation, They're a bit interested they? in, you know, They can be very horses. bright and we wouldn't know about it because it's kept behind closed doors. We do because we know what the Queen reads. We're told she reads Dick Francis. They never knowingly go to the theatre, to any artistic thing, to, to look at paintings, despite William and Kate having had degrees in art history, never knowingly been to an art gallery since. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. There might be security and all those issues that well, are Well, they can go anywhere they want, privately. <laughs> and they have they've had the best education and, in a sense, the highest breeding. And at the end of it all, they are really, really ordinary. Thomas Keeling, I'm amazed well, you want to write about them. You well, wrote a book about them, a book about the Queen. I'm amazed I've written about it so much because if it's true, as Polly says, that this is an absurdity, then I'm an absurd, uh, absurd, uh, absurd observer of it. And it's not just 80% of Britain who, who seem to subscribe to it. Seems to be eighty percent of the rest of the world population who also think that this observed quote unquote is well worth watching. And I think what Polly is uh, um, uh, underestimating is, apart from the personal qualities of individual members, which, as you say, very hard for us to gauge, the the stability of the monarchy as an institution in this day and age is quite remarkable and well worth keeping. Look at all these so-called pillars of society, starting with the banks, with the media, we must include ourselves, with the church and, and politics. They're all down at the dumps, and people really care less and less about them. And amazingly, the monarchy, uh, which 25 years ago thought it had seen the, the last of its days, uh, has risen to a position of where it represents continuity, you know, if you look at my country and talk about heads of states and the <laughs> different heads of states we've had and the political wranglings about it, which demeans often the office, and you have here a royal family which continually holds sway in, in this highest office in the land, I think for, for us as observers, as watchers, this is a very enviable situation to have. Well, they are German. We could send them back <laughs> to you. <laughs> Please do. Nabila, you grew up in a country which uh, famously cut off the heads of its monarch, uh, and yet seems to have had a yearning for some kind of monarchy ever since. But big debates about uh, President Macron in France. Uh, is, is, he, is he getting ideas above his station? He's a monarchical sort of president. Um, has Britain got an advantage here, do you think? 
Well, I think a royal wedding is certainly one of those uniquely British events and is certainly attracting masses of interest around the world. And I have to say that the French are particularly impressed, as you said, despite having got uh, rid of their own royals a long time ago. But they are fascinated by this sense of developing history and indeed the pomp and circumstance. Having said that, I think that this latest wedding is getting many of us quite confused because it's supposed to be a game changer, one that will um, make royalty become more egalitarian and indeed more inclusive. And what troubles me in this is that the whole point of the royal family is that it's supposed to be uh, aloof uh, and indeed um, unashamedly uh, snobbish, uh, dare I say. And so you, you don't fancy a kind of European style bicycling monarchy, the sort of monarchy you would bump into in the gym or the kind of people you might find in a, one of Polly's art galleries? No, I think that uh, uh, fundamentally the monarchy represents a sense of privilege and inherited wealth. And to pretend otherwise is just silly. And I think the reason why the Queen has been such a, fan, um, um, a remarkable monarch is because she has never bowed to this populist uh, agenda and she represents that kind of steep upper lipped Brit who uh, puts service before everything else and never emotes and that's why she's done rather well but I have my fear is that with the young royals we're getting into this celebrity culture uh, and young people you know rather desperate to be loved in spite of their lud ludicrously privileged lifestyle. Just a brief, brief point here about the inherited wealth. The, the amount of money that the monarchy brings in in terms of tourism and other attractions is enormous and makes up easily for whatever the country invests in. A lot in no, but I think that's, that's a fallacious Windsor. argument because you know the main argument about in support of the royal family here is that it attracts tourism and it's a form of soft power. Well, my answer to that is that France is a country that is much more a much more popular tourist destination <laughs> and actually its royal legacy draws uh, still uh, it draws huge crowds and indeed interest and this idea that foreigners come in to meet the royals is ludicrous they want the palaces and uh, the, the, uh, and the, the castles, castles and we don't need castles. living royals uh, the, the <laughs> legacy <laughs> I think you're, I should say that, I assume you're talking about pensioning him off, not off with her head, but <laughs> Stephanie... Well, I would well, say <laughs> Elizabeth the last. <laughs> Stephanie, um, what about the impact in the United States? Because there's, you know, there's huge excitement because Meghan is American. There's huge excitement because of her uh, a mixed race heritage. There's a lot of focus being on a on mum arriving. But disappointment, do you think that Dory Ragland in the end didn't get to water her daughter down the aisle? I think there is uh, in some quarters for sure. I mean, I would disagree uh, that I do think, particularly for American tourists, uh, the royal family is a real magnet and uh, a continuing kind of obsession for many people. And I think for most Americans, the politics of this get lost. They don't understand that there is the British taxpayer funding the royal family, that they don't understand where it, you know, where it lies on that spectrum. Um, and I actually think now what we're seeing is the royal family is, is actually serving a useful uh, role at a time when the country is so divided. You have an apolitical head of state who has remained very tight-lipped and is, in, in a sense, unifying the country. And I would say it's similar in the U.S. where we're so divided. This idea of looking at a royal family that is, does rise above the fray, so to speak, is very appealing. Now, with an American in the mix, of course, this becomes like a Disney fairy tale come true. Um, Grace Kelly all over again. All over again with the added uh, uh, intrigue of her being not only a divorcee, but of mixed race heritage, her having a, a very established career behind her before she enters the royal family, the firm, so to speak. Um, so I think it, it, the fascination is enduring. And I would agree with Thomas that it does provide a tourist boost that is most likely, by most accounts, bigger than what they cost the British taxpayer. You've almost <laughs> sold me. If the alternative is the Trump family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the tourists, we have to be careful. This is a byproduct of the, of the popularity of the monarchy. But I don't think it's, in essence, the thing that makes it tick and that makes it so important for the British. Your argument about uniting the family behind one stable institution is far more important, especially now while we are so divided in Britain and really about the Brexit issue and others, that it's a wonderful uh, respite from all of it to have 
some family uniting the people. Well, we have uh, an example of divisions, of course, much deeper and more troubling than they around are in the UK, <laughs> or indeed in the, around this table in the <laughs> Middle East. 70 years ago this week, the state of Israel was unilaterally established after a UN partition plan, which had been accepted by Jewish leaders, was rejected by Arab ones. This was the original two-state solution, with the contested city of Jerusalem awarded to neither side. War may have changed the borders of Israel in the ensuing years, but the contours of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict have not. The status of Jerusalem is still a flashpoint, which explains the anger of one side and the joy of the other, with Donald Trump's decision to relocate the US embassy there. Even as Israel's birthday and that present were being celebrated, weeks of protests in neighbouring Gaza reached their peak. Israel's Defence Force says it used live ammunition to prevent a breach of the border and the consequent threat to Israeli civilians. On Monday, the actual anniversary of what Palestinians call their catastrophe, nearly 60 of the protesters were killed. I mean, Nabila, th those scenes were, were terrible, whatever people's view of, of the conflict. Where do we go from here? Is there any sign of fresh momentum, which after all, presumably some around Donald Trump believe that they might create by injecting this degree of uncertainty with the embassy decision in Jerusalem? Well, I think first of all, that, you know, it has to be said that there have been some horrendous massacres of, of Palestinians by uh, Israelis over, the, over decades and not least of all over the last few years. I think what uh, this week's uh, slaughter, uh, you know, it was particularly uh, pointed because of what was happening in Jerusalem, where one of the most extreme uh, right-wing Israeli governments for years was working with an almost rogue American administration uh, to show its utter contempt for the peace process, international law and indeed for Palestinian lives. Uh, Palestinians are viewed with terrifying cynicism by all these extremists. We hear apologists uh, making up fantasy scenarios about Gazans orchestrating a huge invasion uh, of not, Israel. But having said that, you, uh, you, you're obviously making the point from your perspective very strongly, but the, the, the view that is expressed by the Israeli government is that people were a threat to enter the country and that live fire was used on them as a result and only in those circumstances. Presumably yep. that is the subject that the UN inquiry will have to try and establish the facts on. Yeah, precisely. Uh, the facts, not the view. Beyond no, no, nor your view or their view. No, no, I'm dealing with facts. My, my facts are, you know, it's, it's anchored in truth. The truth is the Palestinians are in no position whatsoever to invade Israel. Precisely because it's Gaza... it's for individuals to cross the border and cause trouble, isn't it? No, precisely because Gaza is a prison camp right. that's been under siege and under blockade for 11 years. It lacks all the basics, including water, electricity and food and medical supplies. So that's the position as, as this week and the last 11 years. What about where we go from there? No, because but in a sense, it, that's the it challenge, has to be emphasised that the majority, the overwhelming majority of those taking part in the process were unarmed civilians within Gaza itself on their own territory, uh, nowhere near the Israeli fence. And yet this idea that um, a threat could justify indiscriminate execution is Diabolical. Tom, the question here is, and I, I agree, where do we go from here? Um, and, and, and my answer to that is, quite, I quite agree that there is a, a case to be answered here by the Israelis as well as by the uh, um, violent uh, Palestinians, but the, 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 the thing that went awry was the original decision by the Americans to, de mm. to rehouse their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's one of those moments where you ask yourself, what goes on in the US? that they, they, they look at this combustible situation and by hook or by crook continue with something which was promised in the election campaign. Can't they wait, for goodness sake? Sometimes diplomacy requires you to not follow what you said in the election campaign, which is always a heated moment, and look at the, uh, at the likely outcome. And the outcome was predictable. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you rehouse the embassy of the American to Jerusalem, what, what do you expect? You accept bloodbaths. And that's exactly what happened. So the answer to where do we go from here is not again a step backward. Mm -hmm. This was a step backward. This Jerusalem issue and the capital can wait. And whether American re recognizes or not, this is not an issue that needs to be resolved today. Stephanie, we, waited. Know, we know the administration, waited. we know broadly the political consensus in, in the United States is, is pro-Israel as, as, as a state and broadly supportive of Israel's position in relation to Palestinians, although uh, formally backing the two-state solution. Did these scenes cause any unease? Yeah, I, they did, for sure. And I think, um, you know, the American Jewish community was divided, uh, you know, 
as they mm -hmm. are and have been in the past. But this was clearly an attempt by Trump to fulfill a campaign promise, play to his base, which is pro-Israeli voters coupled with Christian evangelicals. Um, and he disregarded what would be the long-term effect on the ground. And, you know, I agree the split images of, on the one hand, Ivanka Trump opening the Jerusalem embassy juxtaposed with mm. uh, slaughter in Gaza and wounded, uh, you know, Palestinians being carted away was very disturbing. Now, when Trump announced this decision in December to move the embassy to Jerusalem and recognize uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, there was some hope that perhaps behind the scenes, this was part of a larger game that on the face of it, it looked like he was giving away this concession without getting anything in return. But maybe, maybe this was part of a broader uh, unorthodox plan. And now that definitely looks like but wishful the, thinking. You yeah, saw that Jared happened. Kushner mm. uh, at the, the son in law, the son in law yeah. who was supposed to be spearheading yeah. Trump's peace process. Uh, say at the opening that those Palestinians that were demonstrating were part of the problem rather than the solution. Yep. Polly, there have been, there, sorry, just to bring Polly in this point, there have been suggestions, for example, that quietly Soto Voce, for example, Benjamin Netanyahu, when he was in Washington, had kind of meetings with some of the Arab country ambassadors, that there may be some sense of perhaps other players coming into this. Do you, do you derive any hope from the, the role of the Arab nations? I think Ms. that's very optimistic. I think once you've had a massacre mm. of nearly 60 people and many, many more, or severely injured of protest unarmed protesters and then you don't buy any suggestion that, that some of those people were being used well, by Hamas you know protest protest is often uh, also includes people who throw stones and get a bit get a bit yeah. get a bit violent of course they do it I mean it happens in protests here sometimes and anyway, it's it's part of protest but Israel sets it up it sets itself up as the only real democracy in that part of the world well what kind of democracy doesn't allow unarmed protest what well, kind their of argument democracy? is they do allow unarmed protest but and you what shoot, happens yeah. if Gaza is you allow them but you shoot yeah, but them, but them. But, the but, but that's not allowing them it's no. a diabolical well, argument you know, if you continue to look at the at the uh, ins and outs mm. of that particular situation of the violence executed and and the response which is supposed to be um, not proportional you're not going to get any with this whole issue this is for the for the investigation to establish what went wrong and so forth and who is more to blame but I think the blame lies squarely on American diplomacy to have allowed this situation to emerge at this moment of time laying the fuse to a potentially disruptive You're situation quite right I mean but Trump has arrived as an entirely disruptive force yes. on the world stage yes. in a whole number of arenas and maybe we thought well the man's a bit of a fool and he won't really do this stuff uh, but it looks as if he's quite serious about unpicking the legacy yeah. of any good legacy of any previous uh, president. But there I say, you know, whatever the affiliations or indeed the intentions mm -hmm. of uh, some of the people, yes. uh, men and women who were shot dead by the Israeli military, this idea that terror or criminal suspect, suspects can be now, uh, who are within Gaza on their own territory, can now be murdered in cold blood alongside what Israel, I'm sure, would call collateral damage is simply monstrous. Uh, you know, this attempt to whitewash illegal attacks on demonstrators uh, says nothing except but prove what a barbaric regime uh, uh, is currently running uh, Israel. But, Rambino, you're still trying to solve the, the question of who's to blame and, and how did this uh, uh, happen. No, but uh, I think uh, an obvious way forward, uh, Thomas, with all due respect, is for Israel to stop murdering Palestinians well, and grant them this basic right to life. Well, it's for some outside force in this case, America, not the right to create the situation. But, Thomas, it's is also for, for the rest of the world's mm. democracies to say this is not how democracies yeah. behave. Your country, my country, your country, we should all well, be saying, don't do this. Mm. And, and I think uh, the problem is actually now what you have is the situation in Gaza is feeding into Trump's narrative that mm. actually walls are the solution and walls are defensible. Mm. And, you know, they are in sync. Mm. And I think it shows now that, you know, the Trump administration is unabashedly pro-Israel, pro-Netanyahu, and they're using that to feed into their argument about walls. Now, Hollywood loves sequels, and after this week's plot twists in efforts to take the nukes out of North Korea, perhaps they'll consider producing a follow-up to Team America World Police. Earlier this century, the film told the story of square-jawed all-American boys and girls taking on Kim Jong-il as he created worldwide mayhem from his Bond villain lair in Pyongyang. The characters in Team America were all puppets. 
In real life, too, you could be forgiven for wondering right now who's pulling the strings. The late Mr Kim's son, Kim Jong-un, has, in a matter of days, gone from hinting that North Korea may give up its nuclear programme to threatening to pull out altogether from a groundbreaking summit meeting with President Trump. I mean, Stephanie, that's one side of it. And on the American side, it's been quite difficult to follow as well. There's John Bolton, who is almost a figure out of central casting, with his big bussy moustache, his glasses and his some quite, quite intentional grumpy manner and demeanour, which he uses as part of his way of getting his points across forcefully, apparently being slapped down by his own president barely a few months after he was appointed as national security advisor. Right. Well, if you read the statement that North Korea put out, he is the central character and he is the one at, they actually called him repugnant. Um, at, he's the one that has set them off by making this comparison on a Face the Nation interview that his model for North Korea is uh, the denuclearization program deal that they did with Libya. Um, now, that has infuriated the North Koreans for two reasons. One, they don't want to see themselves as ending up with the fate of Libya or Iraq. And as we know, in 2003, the U.S. did a deal with uh, Libya for a very nascent, to get rid of a very nascent uh, nuclear program. Um, and then just years later, in 2011, Gaddafi, uh, you know, there were military strikes. Gaddafi was uh, in a ditch and it was then killed. So, you know, and that has prompted Trump to come out and say, we, this is not about regime change. We're going to be offering protection, whatever that means, to uh, North Korea. And Libya is not our model. Uh, in fact. It's a pretty brutal public put down. It was a brutal public put down, but now what you have is a very clear split between his two main advisors on this. Uh, Bolton on the one hand, who's a much more of a hawk, and Mike Pompeo, who has actually gone in, gone to North Korea. Secretary of State, newly appointed. It, yeah. Newly appointed, and is much more careful in his language and what he has said. And I just think what, what we're seeing now is that the two sides are far apart in how you define these terms, denuclearization. Um, you know, the U.S. wants complete reversible denuclearization before they start lifting sanctions. And North Korea wants it done in stages with sort of synchronized steps uh, by Washington to lift sanctions and, you know, uh, help the economy. I think it's terrific that we got to the stage of actually possibly having talks when just a little while ago it was, you know, little rocket man and abuse <laughs> both sides. <laughs> But the trouble is, I just don't think Trump or his split, now split administration are capable of the subtlety required. What's absolutely clear uh, is that the North Vietnamese are not going to altogether give up their nuclear capability. North Koreans. No, sorry. North Koreans. Yeah, you see, it's, so it's back, to, back, back to the future. To the, back to the future. <laughs> <laughs> they are not going to. Why should they? By becoming nuclear, they have brought an American president to meet them. I mean, this is phenomenal. This is a tiny little impoverished country. And just by having a nuclear weapon, they have brought the, the most powerful country in the world to its door. Uh, that's what they've learned. Now, there is no way that anybody is going to be able to scrutinize if they've still got some weapons somewhere. It's not possible. All that you can hope for is that you get a peaceful understanding between North and South Korea and with the Americans backing that up and that uh, the nuclearization is as minimal as possible, you know, that it's mothballed. But um, I don't think that as a hope that Trump would accept that, he will accept no, nothing no, but you, the absolute denuclearization. Do you think that North Koreans have been quite clever in sort of effectively publicly exposing the, the divisions in, in the White House administration? Well, the North Koreans have actually referred to Trump as human scum. And meanwhile, uh, they despise John Bolton, his uh, senior um, security advisor. Uh, and Bolton himself doesn't have much confidence in, in Trump. He sees him as particularly naive, who's on his way to uh, another terrible deal. And that's the problem with Donald Trump. As usual, he's tripped a massively uh, complex and potentially catastrophic foreign policy issue into a simple chance to make himself popular and, and perhaps even win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he sees everything, including complex di um, diplomacy involving nuclear arms in terms of deal making. And, and that's the problem, I think, in general term. You know, what he wants now with uh, um, the North Korean leader is some face time with somebody he's regularly insulted and he's even threatened with devastating military action. Wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall, Tom? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, trying to reach deals about nuclear arms in itself, I don't think it's a bad idea. And Nixon and, and, and Kissinger had, had nuclear arms deals with the Soviet Union and, and through some somewhat limited but very good effect. And I don't think the North Koreans uh, expose the division in the American um, uh, administration. It is all over the place. <laughs> 
face. <laughs> and when you say it was a brutal put down, well, I'm not impressed. You, you often sacked people who <laughs> only ad, um, ad, um, adopt, um, appointed a day or so before. So that is part and parcel of the entire way that they do business there. I, I think the mistake here again is uh, talking about what will be the issue of the of the um, uh, um, meeting in the first place. Why not keep mum until it's actually happening? Yes. Why pr pronounce ahead of time either the security man or the or, uh, or the uh, foreign secretary or whatever, or Mr. Trump, what is their game plan, as it were? This is what allows the other side to play nicely and expose, as you say, the divisions. And they have themselves to blame for these divisions. Yeah, but I think in general term, what Trump has done is has he has infantilized politics and indeed foreign policy, reducing it to man babies squabbling. And as far yeah. as the safety of the world is concerned, this is massively dangerous. Well, we you just only have, have to hope to he lowers his expectations. Yep. The worry is that he will accept nothing but no nuclear weapons, and that's not. But you only happen. have to look at his policies towards the Palestinians to see that he's an abject warmonger. And he aligns himself with alleged war criminals like Netanyahu and well, not and with the peacemakers uh, they, uh, of this world. Do you, do you use that phrase? It's not a phrase that you can describe as an objective phrase. People have different views. He's an elected prime minister of a country, whether you like him or not. Oh, I said but in terms of, war but in terms of, but in terms of Donald Trump, you don't have much faith in his ability to pull this off. I mean, he's pulled off surprises. Even getting the summit was a surprise. Wasn't it? No, I think what my point about the Palestinian issue is that is to prove that he's aligning himself with people who are not interested in peace yeah. or indeed justice, but are warmongers. Okay. But it's enough to say that he doesn't see through his own policies. To think that. In the end, he has to uh, pronounce a protection of, an, of a brutal regime in North Korea, so mm. we won't touch you. You can do what you like <laughs> yes. with your own people as you long as you do something on yeah. Shows that he's, he's reached a cul-de-sac of Thomas, his own making. Thomas, Polly, Stephanie, Nabila, thank you all very much. Thank you for your company. We'll be back same time next week. Bye-bye.